All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here or Aaron Svansel. And tonight my culture series continues. Thank you firstly and foremost. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent th feedback that I've gotten so far in the series. Uh, it makes it worthwhile. Uh, just some of the messages that people have sent me and uh, some of the feedback that I've seen really uh, encourages me to continue because this is a series that really excites me in regards to the, the content. It's something that I feel very passionate about. I think culture uh, can help explain a lot of the, the things that's going on in our world, but also a lot of the internal politics of South Africa itself. And that's why I started this series, to give people that type of insight that we're not all the same in regards to how we view the world, what type of values we have, what we prioritize as regard in regards to what is the most important things in life. Uh, but we also have things in common. And I think that's also one of the great things that has emerged from uh, my episodes so far is the commonalities that we've seen. So tonight we're continuing with uh, South African Anglos or English speaking South Africans or whatever you want to call them. I'll, I'll get into uh, what the official name of Scott's tribe is real soon. And to join me here tonight is Scott McLaren. He's the co-host of Reactionary Opinions. Uh, you can go check out his channel. There's a link in the description. And tonight we're going to delve a little bit deeper into his culture and uh, what he thinks uh, are the important tenets of it and also the important values of it. So welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, thanks, Aaron. It's good, good to be here. Mm. Oh, I'm glad to have you. So first and foremost, maybe let's just get this out of the way. All the tribes or the groups in South Africa have very distinct names. I mean, you have the Chwanas, the Zulus, the Afrikaners. But you guys don't seem to really have an official name. I mean, I use the term Anglos because I think that's the most technically correct uh, term. But there's also English speaking South Africans in uh, Alistair Sparks's book, The Mind of South Africa. He actually jokes about the fact that uh, I think he calls you the, the ESPs or something like that, the English speaking South Africans. Or English speakers uh, you don't really have that name and he actually makes a point of it in his book where he says that is a very big cultural facet where you don't have that uh, collective identity where you have a name or a banner that you rally under so what would you say is the what are your thoughts on that conundrum well I mean yeah that's an interesting observation and it's it's 100 true you know um the, the Anglos or, or English speaking people and stuff but you know the interesting thing about Anglo is that it's not really uh, yes, it's directly linked to the English language and stuff, but it's not necessarily um, Britons. It's more sort of the, if you want to go far back, it's more sort of the uh, Germanic um, tribes that uh, that sort of invaded parts of Britain and stuff when they were controlled by the Roman Empire, and um, and 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 they were sort of the Anglo-Saxons. You know, they were um, from Saxony and stuff, so they were German Germanic tribes and stuff, but. Us as ethnically um, Anglo's, if I can use that word, so you know people that are sort of, I guess you can who can trace their genetics back to those original sort of Anglo-Saxons, uh, like I can, um, would generally be known as Anglo's. But um, in South Africa as a whole, um, the the English-speaking community, I don't really think they don't really. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not like we have like an Anglo club or an, an Anglo, like uh, like you guys have Afri Forum. You know, we don't have Anglo Forum, you know. It's, uh, it, 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 there's nothing, there's no sort of identity as, as Anglos. Um, you know, you might, you might have some sort of identity as an, as an English speaker, but it's very vague. Um, it's not very, um, uh, it, it's not very, it's not. Its foundations are not very firm culturally, if that makes any any sense. Not unlike unlike the the Afrikaans people and stuff. And I think that I think that all comes down to that. You know, the the, the English, the, the Anglo's that came sort of the, their one sort of defining point here in South Africa. You know, apart from other things, but our one sort of folklore defining point would have been the eighteen twenty settlers. You know, the the um, the 1820 settlers that, that you know came to South Africa uh, made something of themselves. They were frontier people. They took raw, you know, ground and converted it into, you know, farms and schools and buildings and cities and and all that sort of thing. They settled, and <laughs> Anglo Club is the DA. <laughs> hardly, <laughs> hardly. <laughs> but um, but yeah. So the um, 
so yeah, so that that is our sort of defining, I guess what what, what you'd call it would be uh, like, like the uh, a defining moment, a defining um, folk moment, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. That's why you know, um, and we were chatting about this briefly before the the, the show, the eighteen twenty settler monument in Grahamstown is a which monument is thumbnail, that, which is the thumbnail of the stream yeah yeah the thumbnail of the stream is the little statue of the you know 1820 settlers with their kid I, I don't know the exact i remember hearing the exact details of it because you know i grew up in the eastern cape so we used to often go to grahamstown for the um uh, grahamstown arts festival and, and that sort of thing and that was you know the, the arts festival very much was sort of a an Anglo festival, so sort of like an, a, a celebration of 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 of, of Anglo culture, and uh, but you know the the Grahamstown Arts Festival. I mean, I you know I live now in Cape Town. I haven't really heard much about it. I don't think it's as much of a celebrated event now as it um, as it used to be um, in the past. I think that um, it's it's sort of fading out unfortunately and that is one of the challenges that we face as um anglo south africans sort of culturally anglo south mm. africans mm. and like you mentioned the eastern cape i mean there's a pretty a pretty clear divide between uh, english speaking south africans in the cape and in the eastern cape there's a big cultural difference there's a heritage difference uh, could you maybe uh, in a very a succinct manner sum that up in regards to what those distinct differences are so look i think i personally think that um that, that everyone of 1820 settler stock so your the, the the english oaks that you'll find in in the eastern cape and uh in kzn and those sort of places would generally be of uh 1820 settler stock okay um it's a lot more different here in the cape um, you don't see as many, um, the, 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 not a lot of the Anglos of a year are direct descendants mm. of 1820 settler stocks. But, but something that is definitely distinct um, amongst um, the Anglos from KZN and, and the Eastern Cape and that sort of thing is even though, you know, look, I, don't, I didn't grow up on a farm and stuff, but I grew up in a small town. And there is always that, and, and this is something that is always going to come up in these sort of discussions, is there's always that sort of strong agrarian connection, you know. And when I say agrarian, I don't necessarily mean that you're a farmer, you know. Sure, that's the idea behind it, you know, from the word agriculture and stuff. But the the agrarian connection comes more so sort of from a, a frontier perspective. So, you know, the, the idea of, taking, like I said earlier on, taking a patch of land and converting it into something that generates food, that generates wealth, that generates a community, and eventually that generates a society. And that is something that that I think that the early um, Anglo settlers and stuff held very, very dear to themselves. And um, again, you know, unfortunately, I think culturally, that is very much lost on English speakers in South Africa. That sort of idea that that of what the 1820 settlers actually did. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the Afrikaans people can can draw from the Groot Trek, you know, and and that's their that's their moment, you know, um, mm-hmm. of many. You know, the, the Afrikaners have many of those kind of moments. That's kind yeah, of the Afrikaners have the the Great Trek, Blood River, the Boer War. These exactly. are all like, I mean, uh, this is more in a technical sense, not in a mythological sense, but origin myths, not to say yeah. that they're not true, but more of like the, the stories that define your culture's identity. Yeah, the, the reason why we call them myths or the reason why, you know, it's a good thing to describe them as origin myths is not because they're untrue, but they almost have, like you say, sort of a mythological appeal to them, you know, and it appeals to the human spirit that I do of you know being able to uh, that these guys came here and they against all odds you know they conquered the environment they conquered the land and all that sort of thing and again and I'll, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later as we sort of go on and all of that is it's the idea of um, it's it, that's a that's a very strong Christian idea that as well the idea of conquering 
the earth and 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 controlling uh, having control over uh, over the land over the animals and that sort of thing and that is very much sort of a a christian idea you know to take a bare land bare piece of land and convert that into something great that is that was the essentially the frontier idea and that is something that uh, the 1820 settlers uh, really, uh, you know, they took very, very seriously, and um, mm. again, lost to uh, lost through the ages, unfortunately. Mm. And now, when we're talking about, uh, even though there is a lot of contention in regards to what defines your culture, I think you're one of the cultures in South Africa that has the the most grey area in regards to where your perimeters are. But if you had to identify core values and ideas that shaped uh, your community, uh, to your community with very fuzzy borders, um, what would you identify as some really defining uh, values and ideas? Sure. Okay. Um, look, it, it's a difficult one. That it's a difficult thing to answer. That. Um, but what I will say is, if I had to choose sort of distinct core values, I'd have to say. One thing that influenced sort of, and I'll, I'll get Western civilization and then by extension, obviously, um, uh, Anglo culture and that sort of thing would have to have been Christianity, you know, mm. um, that, that is, you know, and it, and it's across the board. Okay. I'll get into a little bit more, uh, of what I mean by that in just a second, but basically I was raised with a sort of a clear understanding that, that faith is what drives us. And by us, I mean my family, and by extension, our greater community, and um, obviously then culture. However, I think that each, each culture within the Western idea, so the idea, the Western idea, um, each culture um, within that Western idea still have the unique sort of aspects of how they live out that, that faith. Um, for example, um, some might have religion permeate every aspect of their lives. Um, for me, it wasn't really that way. Um, we had the freedom to sort of choose our own path, and we were only really made to sort of go to church until I was about, I guess, probably about 13 years old or so. Um, but Christianity, you know, formed a big part of um, of, of what. Um, our culture was about um but so many people don't really understand what i mean by when i say christianity being a core value what i mean by it is the is the and this this is also you know profoundly similar um across all anglo spheres so when i say when i say anglo spheres i mean sort of the i mean like new zealand australia uh, the United Kingdom, um, the United States, those are all sort of Anglo countries and they're all part of the Anglo uh, sphere. So um, I think that plays a, a very, very big part of, 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 of what it is and, and how it is. So, but the, the, the true meaning behind it is the true idea of Western patriarchy. Now, this is something that's very, very unique to the, the culture, and it's um, something that is only really found in Western, in the Western Christian world. And it is essentially the idea that men are meant to die for their families and not women and children. The idea that Christ taught us to be willing to die for his people. Uh, so we must basically do the same. Um, basically, because, our, because your family is Christ's people. So you protect, defend, die for that family. Um, so the pivotal role that a man plays in the culture is, and, the, and family is key. Um, unfortunately, in African and Islamic culture, although this is changing in African culture because of the growth of Christianity in Africa, unfortunately in those cultures, it's the women that bear the children, raise them, discipline them, teach them, and pretty much do everything around the children. Um, a man is very much absent in this frame and only really plays a part when the child is well into her teens or his or her teens. Remember, that's what we spoke about earlier on before we came on the on the stream, uh, Alan, about my, my child and, and the, the formative years and making sure that you get that part right. Um, so that's basically a prime reason why. So the Anglos basically took that idea uh in the family so the idea of the family 
and the remember the smallest the smallest idea of a of a society or whatever is the family model so they took that and then as it grew it sort of grew into the society and spread and spread and spread and so on um and um so i think that that christian things really plays a part in it. but you know mm. anglo culture like i've just sort of basically told you now what western culture is which is pretty much your culture so i'm not really telling you anything interesting am i but um <laughs> but what defines anglo culture really is its rigid uprightness order precision it's a true understanding that you come from stock that conquered the world um the british empire pretty much conquered the entire world um the the anglo idea that rigidity uh, uprightness order and precision and stuff in the south african context however it's uh without a doubt a staunch agrarian idea like i mentioned the connection with land and and all of that and that's um and and there's also other ideas to that you know the the unfortunate part of the of the white man's burden and stuff those are those are also um aspects of um anglo culture but um but yeah that's that's pretty much in a nutshell in my idea is that anglo culture is christianity in a you know in a whole my culture at least the culture that i grew up in mm. I see here's a comment from Gray McLaren who says, remember that the majority of the 1820 settlers were reformed Protestants with a work ethic typical Protestants at the time. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And that, who's that, what's that rubbish surname there, Graham? McLaren, <laughs> you with your Anglo, that's my brother, Graham. But anyway. <laughs> He's obviously right. watching. But Graham's, Graham's a, a, a history teacher, so he knows a lot of stuff about the 1820 settlers. It's one of his mm. fortes. Oh, that's excellent. Well, uh, seeing as we've covered the, the religion part of your culture, uh, there's something else that, and we've talked about origin myths and the, the mythical side of it, um, but every culture has a symbol or symbols, things that evoke an emotion were when presented to a member of that culture. For the Afrikaners, there's also a lot, for example, the, the you can take foot tracker symbolism like the ox wagon, um, even the from the more later period, uh, for example, the border border war with the, the image of the buffalo also evokes a lot of emotion. And I, I've heard that a lot of uh, the black African uh, cultures in South Africa associate the Afrikaners with the buffalo, actually, ironically enough. But are there any symbols in uh, English South African culture that come to mind or things that you would consider symbols that uh, are that are that match or link up with that culture? Yeah, look, um, uh, and unfortunately, there's a, there's a lot of oaks that have done a lot of good in this world, but you are also also done a lot of bad in this world you know so guys like um you know obviously you know cecil john rhodes he's sort of a a symbol um in in in, in anglo culture um i just saw on the weekend there was uh, dr peter hammond uh, from the reformation society took a whole bunch of guys up to the Rhodes memorial to go and um, clean it up there because you know the oaks go up there and you know you know uh, use the toilet in the corner of the place and all that sort of thing. not an actual toilet but you know what i mean um mm -hmm. so they um they went and cleaned up the place and uh and all of that so that 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 definitely is a a, a symbol um the you know cecil john Rhodes and and all of that but i think i think in all honesty something that would evoke emotion in a in an anglo that knows their history would be something similar to to the to the boers as well the the ox wagon um, that was also, you know, part of um, Anglo uh, 1820 settlers um, imagery as well. Um, it's it's also in the um, uh, the 1820 settler monument as well. Um, but again, you know that that monument, that monument where it has the mother, the father, and the child. Again, remember that, mm. like I, I, I mentioned, the family being pivotal to 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 um, Anglo culture, and it's very similar to the, um, the the Boers culture as well. You know, family also vitally, vitally important. 
And um, I don't think, honestly, I don't think that um, apart from that, look, the, 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 um, the English, the Anglo culture and stuff, I don't, we don't really have much in the line of symbolism and, and that sort of thing. I mean, we could always sort of elude back to the, the, the British heritage, you know, sort of the, um, the, the Union Jack and, and all that sort of stuff. But it really doesn't, you know, the way I was raised, now I grew up in a Rhodesian house, and um, um, there's, there were two types of Rhodesians. There was the Rhodesians that were okay with the crown, and there were Rhodesians that hated the crown. Um, and I grew up in one of the families that hated the crown, you know. Um, so, you know, that doesn't really evoke any kind of emotion in me seeing a Union Jack or... Um, or any sort of old British stuff, uh, but what does what does evoke emotion in me personally is my um, you know I'm I'm of uh, Scottish and, and Irish heritage, and um, something that would evoke an emotion in me would be things like um, you know uh, the bagpipes, um, that sort of thing, and that. That I think is quite common, actually, in Anglo culture in South Africa as well. Is the the bagpipes mm. being a symbol of um, of Anglo culture and all of that as well? Hmm. Uh, would you say then that, for example, when you brought up religion earlier, wouldn't you say then that Protestant symbolism would be symbols that uh, English South Africans identify with? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. The 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 the, the church would be um, central. In, in, in Anglo culture, um, traditionally. Um, mm. so yes, I would, I would definitely think that, um, uh, you know, the idea of, um, uh, escaping, um, persecution and that sort of thing would also play a big, um, part of the Anglo culture. I'm, I'm again, I'm a, I'm a unique, I'm a unique, um, Anglo because I'm actually not, uh, Protestant. I'm, I'm Catholic. But I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised Protestant. But yeah, hmm. uh, I see a sideline opinion said the English culture in the Eastern Cape, which I came to know, was one of community, social conscience, arts, literature, and sport. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. You know, the the, the reality of it is, um, you know, especially the arts, literature, and sport. Now that that growing up in a small town in the Eastern Cape, sports was big. I mean, even in a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere you know my my dad always made the joke he said it's a one horse town but the horse died years ago you know but um it, it's it's a small little town no one really knows about it but sport was big but something else that that um that a lot of people don't understand or don't know this um is that a lot of major major institutes and institutions um in south africa were built by 1820 settlers and Anglos. I mean, the private schools, uh, some of the great private schools, St. Andrews, St. Stithians, all of these private schools were Sacks, all of them. These were all Anglo schools built by mm. Anglos. Um, the, um, the, the, a, a lot of the universities were also built by Anglos. Um, a lot of the major institutions um, were built by Anglos. There was also... Um, um, I wonder. Graham, actually, I wonder who's behind who built Rhodes University. That's that's the that's the the riddle. <laughs> I don't care. They can burn it to the ground. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> the uh, my my brother actually told me about. Um, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the architect Herbert Baker. Um, he's a very mm -hmm. famous Anglo architect, and he actually designed uh, South African. Uh, yeah, yeah, South African, Anglo, yeah. He actually designed, get this, Adanst, don't get too triggered now and stuff, but uh, he actually designed the uh, the, <coughs> the union buildings. <coughs> um, he also designed uh, Grote Skier um, and a whole bunch of other schools and, and mm. stuff as well. So, so very, very famous Anglos and stuff. Look, uh, a lot of Joburg also was built by, by wealthy Anglos and, and, and stuff, so... Port Elizabeth, the whole, yeah. basically, the whole of Port Elizabeth was built by Anglo's. Um, a lot of, uh, and you know, this is the whole thing is, is East London. Hmm. 
uh, East London, even though, you know, it's, you know, the nickname for East London is, right? Mm -mm. They call it Slum Town or Slummies for short. Yeah, it's an absolute dump. But uh, it's, it's not that bad. It's not. It's it's way better mm -hmm. than the town I grew up in. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, look, um, this disconnection, this the, or, or this this the fact that it's almost like that information is mystically sort of lost to history now. You know, one of those ancient mysteries. You know, those mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna start talking about like Anglo culture as if it's like one of those UFO shows. You know, like like who, who built the were, pyramids? Yeah, yeah, who who built Hrutskir? You know, kind of thing. You know, who built these things? You know, who mm -hmm. designed these things and stuff? Yeah, it's exact. It, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like that because you know uh, there's, there's a, but but I think that. Um, Oh, that's a good comment by Graham over there. I want to if you can no, just bring we'll get that to up. it now. Okay, but um, <laughs> but I think the reason why it's almost lost to um, to history is because I think that a lot of Anglo's, unlike the Afrikaans folks, I think that a lot of Anglo's still maintained their sort of connection to Mother Island, to mm. the UK and stuff. They maintained their to connection. The yeah, to the empire, and basically, I mean, this this is so evident. I mean, what happened in 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 Zimbabwe when Mugabe got power, you know, probably I'd go as far as to say maybe a third or maybe even more, maybe even as much as half of uh, of the of the white uh, oaks there in in Rhodesia just packed their bags and off they went back to you know the UK, you know, um, and I mean, it, it's imagine ever, trading that Zimbabwean climate for Birmingham. Oh, I don't know. I, you know, I always say this, Adams. My my family left the the Mud Island exactly two hundred years ago, to the year. Okay, for a reason. I'm not going to go and undo that now. Eh? <laughs> so I'm just saying. But um, oh, there's a bit of an echo there Is that coming through. Okay. No, oh, no um, there's no echo. Okay, it's gone. But I think, so what happened is, and, and it's quite evident that a lot of South African Anglos maintained their connection with the empire because what happened is, and it's quite evident in today. I mean, how many, honestly, how many English Oaks do you know, Ernst, that have a British passport? I know tons, tons, mm. a lot of them, okay? It's like literally out of my friends, probably 80% of them have British mm. passports. And this, I think, is part of the reason why uh, Anglo culture has just sort of been thrown to the wayside because there's no real need to maintain it and to and yeah. to and to. Well, that's where the that's where the derogatory Afrikaner term for uh, English South Africans comes from, a soti, uh, yeah. which means uh, you standing with one leg in England and one leg in South Africa, and something dangles in the ocean. Um, so, but that's exactly what you were describing there. That uh, that almost like English South Africans have a, a, a key to the back door. If anything uh, ever goes wrong, uh, they can exactly always uh, get out it's of exactly dodge. Exactly. I could I could never I could never understand how that soap peel. Am I, not, I suppose I'm right to say that soap peel thing is an insult because to me it's quite a compliment because you know you have to be quite <laughs> gifted for that to for that to be real. You know. <laughs> but anyway, um, but yeah, that that is. Um, uh, I, I personally think that is a big reason as to why um, uh, Anglo culture has sort of been, and it's rich. I mean, Adam, it, it, it is really rich. So it, it, all you need to do is whenever you get a chance. Now, here's the thing, Adam, I've been up to Pretoria literally just to see your guys' monument, okay? You have to make a mission now to go to Grahamstown to go and see our monument, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll organize a tour of the Eastern Cape. Uh, and we'll cool. do that. Cool. It's not it's not as impressive as your guys monument. Um it looks it looks kind of funny. It's like a funny looking building. It it looks more like a conference center than than anything else. Like it's mm. not it's not elegant. It's not um it's not like like the the Four Tracker monument has meaning in literally everything it, it has it, a presence. It has. Yeah, and it, it everything that every brick was laid with like a meaning or something with the mm -hmm. with the, the foot i mean with the with the 1820 settler monument it just looks like a i mean like the, a, the foot like, monument is built and designed in a way that on the the 16th of december of uh 
sunshine. Yeah, the the sun shines through the roof and onto the 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 piece of granite in the middle that says "Ons Fia South Africa." Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a beautiful place. But uh, enough about my culture. <laughs> There's one more thing before we get to the bagpipes uh, comment. Uh, Sideline opinion says service club and dramatic societies and country clubs form the backbone of those rural communities. Your Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. It was, um, it was, you know, country clubs and and, you know, you go to any small town in the Eastern Cape. I mean, any small town. It's pretty common all over South Africa, though. Um, but but pretty much every small town revolves around the country club. Um, mm -hmm. Either the country club, the golf club, the bowls club is also a big one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even my old man, my old man plays bowls on Saturdays. That's his thing. You know, yeah. and and that was also you know play bowls, you know, go to the bar, have a drink and stuff, and then go home kind of thing. Mm. And that was, uh, that, that's a big part of, um, uh, and it sounds stupid, um, you know, it sounds like pointless and stuff, but the reason why, you know, many, many a business deal and many a, uh, a, a, a marriage or whatever it is was made in those, areas you know in those places well that's their function areas. that's their function is to to introduce people in the community and to have intra well i, I don't know if i'm using the word right intra-communal like interaction between young people or uh, business people yeah. uh, so that you, you pretty much do business deals uh, on the golf course or you meet your wife at the the bowling tournament or whatever um no, but just yeah. Uh, and then there's this uh, comment that you noticed earlier. Uh, Graham says the bagpipes are also a symbol of resistance to the crown, especially amongst those of Scottish heritage. So before you comment on this, when you comment on this, could you also incorporate uh, uh, an, el an elaboration on that divide that you talked about earlier, where there are some Anglos that are still view themselves as loyal to the empire and the crown and those that uh, despise it? Could you explain that while you respond to this comment? Yeah, so the the bagpipes, like, here's the thing is, if, if, you know, I was always told that, um, you know, um, that if you don't like the sound of the bagpipes, then you probably don't have any Scottish or Irish blood in you. Uh, black, bagpipes are pretty much um, uh, a, a symbol of, of basically a middle finger to the, to the, to the crown. Um, mm -hmm. They were, they were very much in battle at I think they were used sort of as a um, almost like a like a war cry kind of thing, and um, I think uh, yeah, that's what Graham says over here. He says, "What bagpipes will motivate the Scots in battle?" The loads of accounts where they were used as a way to rally the men in battle. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Um, if you don't have um, if you don't have if you don't enjoy the bagpipes, you probably don't have. Scottish blood in you or Irish blood in you because mm. bagpipes are originally Irish though. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if, I don't know. A lot of people can't stand the bagpipes. My wife is one of them and you know, mm. my wife is from Peru, so she definitely doesn't have any Scottish blood in her. Mm. Um, but um, thankfully my, my daughter does have Scottish blood in her. Mm. Sideline opinion says, and not British, but uh, and not British, but a unique sense of humor, witty and sarcastic. The, the, oh, hey, the British, nothing can beat the British sense of humor. Um, you know, we all know that. We've all, we've all, you know, enjoyed watching sort of Faulty Towers and uh, Monty Python, that, Monty Python, and all of that. I mean, we all grew up with that. I mean, I can remember. I, I can remember back in the day. I mean, I must have been about, I don't know, twelve, thirteen years old or something, and and. You know, back in the day when when Oaks used to rent uh, video machines, and mm. uh, we went and rented a video machine and rented all these British comedy shows and stuff, and rolling on the ground laughing at these brilliant shows and stuff. So yeah, mm. it was that was that was quite something. And then another comment: uh, English people are generally fond of nature conservation and history and maintenance of statues and monuments. Is this true? Yeah, um, and that that's quite clear and obvious in the uh, the. Um, so, Dr. Peter Hammond is a well-known missionary here in the Western Cape. Um, have you ever have you ever heard of uh, Peter Hammond, Ernst? No. 
Oh, he's a brilliant guy, a really, really interesting guy. Um, and he runs a, a, a mission called um, the uh, Reformation Society. Um, brilliant, brilliant operation. Um, and he he went up there to the Rhodes Memorial and sort of cleaned it up and freshened it up and all of that. Mm. And that is definitely, yeah, I would I would have to agree with was it sideline opinions that made mm -hmm. the comment. Mm. Yeah, I would have to I would have to definitely agree with that. Mm. And we've also got a, an ex Rhodesian in the chat. Uh, Rhodesians will never die, says uh, hello guys. Hi, how's it? A roadie. Mm. All right. Uh, then uh, back to the questions that I've had uh, that I wanted to ask you in regards to the household that you grew up in. Uh, was there a strong cultural element there in regards to uh, that distinguished it from like just any other, for example, that distinguished it from an Afrikaner household or that you would say uh, defined it as uh, that you didn't just grow up in a sterile household. There was a cultural or religious element that kind of defined it. Mm. Yeah, look, I think it started with um, um, my dad and uh, my dad has a lot of books okay? um, and, you know, we used to sort of read books about um, Graham Will, Graham Will vouch for this. There was this great book that we had called The Highlander and not, not the movie Highlander, but it was basically a mm. book about all the Scottish uh, uh, clans and stuff in the Highlands and all of these and uh and we would sort of look back on these times and enjoy them and and uh, educate ourselves on our you know ancestral um history and heritage and that sort of thing mm. and that definitely that definitely formed a a innate pride in us um to be part of that because look that 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 is an important thing that culture does do it it instills a, a form of pride, not 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 a selfish pride, but a or a sinful pride, but a a a focused pride, a pride that allows you to hold your head up high, kind of thing. Hmm. That's uh, that same pride you feel, for example, when one of your family main members has a, a, an accomplishment. Exactly, exactly like that. Yes, hmm. or you know uh, the pride of you know your your high school or whatever it is. That that sort hmm. of uh, that, that, that your football team <laughs> yeah yeah your rugby team as well yeah that's, yeah, that's yeah. exactly it yeah um mm. but but it, it it instilled that sort of pride in us to be um of that descent and then obviously like i said i mean we used to go up to grahamstown fairly often um, um my mother was a teacher and all of that and we used to go up to Grahamstown and to the monument and all of that. And that was always um, part of um, our, our upbringing and stuff. It wasn't, it's not like it was, you know, enforced on us or anything like that. It was just, it was just a, a fun extra that, uh, that we, that we learned as kids growing mm. up. Mm. Check sideline opinions asks, is bribe part of English culture? Tell you what sideline opinions Come over to my house for a bribe, and I'll show you. <laughs> right. I also see he says here, uh, the English can laugh at themselves. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is, look, that, yes, that is 100% true. Now, I I personally think that a, um, and it's changing, though. Hey? A lot of the English oaks are becoming a little bit more finicky and uh, English like cooked foods, not fried or fried. Yeah, uh, that, no, no, no. That's that's, yeah. That's one thing that us Anglo's don't have in common with the, the, the what's it? The Mud Island Oaks. Uh, -uh. their food is just horrible. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, the English can sort of laugh at themselves, and that's that's a big part of it. And I think what it, where it comes from is the ability to laugh at yourself comes from a a reasonably high self-esteem now mm. if you find that if you if you are someone that can't laugh at themselves you generally have or, or, or struggle with a low self-esteem because you know you could kind of get offended by what someone says and that you know makes you feel bad or whatever it is but if you are comfortable with who you are um, uh, 
you know, you, you have a, a reasonably high self-esteem, you can laugh at yourself and even make fun of yourself, like a lot of the English guys do. But it's changing, though, mm. South Afri in South African English and mm. stuff. Like, you know, well, the, I would say uh, if you if your empire and your people control a third of the, the planet's landmass, uh, I think you can laugh at yourself. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's the whole. That's the whole thing. And you know, this is this is the funny thing is, uh, Ernst is the way I like to see it is when I said when I made that comment where I said that um, that um, that oh gosh, sorry, I just got distracted by a sideline opinions comment over there taking me up on my invitation for a bri. Anytime, bro. Anytime. I promise you. So. Um, why I made that that uh, oh gosh I'll, it'll, it'll have to it'll have to come back to me I'm sorry Adams I just we'll get to that now so yeah so you say you did uh, visit that statue that's in the thumbnail uh, that was a thing that your family did mm, mm, mm. fairly fairly often I mean the the the, um, the 1820 settler monument is quite common and like I said we used to go there for school outings and. And all mm. of that, and uh, um, it was obviously, you know, like I mentioned, the, the Grahamstown Arts Festival, and this is interesting because I think it was sideline opinions that mentioned culture and that sort of thing, and the Grahamstown Arts Festival basically was a showcase of a lot of Anglo culture and art and theatre and that sort of thing. That's why Rhodes was uh, Rhodes Memorial. I mean, not Rhodes Memorial, Rhodes University and stuff was quite uh, famous for its, you know, arts and that sort mm. of thing. But it was also famous for its drinking societies as well, which is, and its highest dropout rate because of alcoholism and stuff. Mm. <laughs> now, uh, you touched on this earlier, but I want to get uh, a bit deeper into it, and that is the the views on the empire uh, within South mm. African English culture. There seems to be a division, but uh, do the majority of English South Africans still view themselves just as one of the the satellites of the great empire, or is the is that view changing? Sadly, I think I think yes. Sadly, I think that a lot of people view themselves more so as yeah, you know, like I said, like you said, satellites or extensions of the of the empire and that sort of thing. I don't, I don't think that, um, mostly because I think that, you know, South Africa is in a horrible situation at the moment. It's in a, it's in a, it's in a really bad state. Um, and I think that it's, it's convenient for people who are able to, like you say, have a key to the back door kind of thing. It's convenient and it's quite easy for them to sort of just say, you know what guys, um, I'm not, I'm, uh, it's just not worth my time to put up with it. And they just sort of, you know, capitulate whether they are okay, whether they are okay with um, moving to the UK and all that sort of thing is irrelevant. Um, the, the point is, is that, you know, times are tough. Um, times might be less tough for them in the UK or whatever it is. So they, they would then sort of, you know mm. move or immigrate to the uk yeah and i but think, I think that, yeah as you explained earlier in the show uh, the thing keeping you here is that long lineage and that heritage that you have and if you don't have that i mean then it's a no-brainer that you wouldn't want to stay in a country where you have less opportunities but for me it's exactly the same i mean i wrote an opinion piece on this where my family's been here for nine generations uh, i think it'd be a very big anti-climax if i were just to to leave now um yeah that's the that's the thing eh? is you know and I think about that a lot. Eh? Um, I, you know, obviously, you know, my wife is foreign, um, and you know, I think about what would happen or, or what would it be like if I had to just sort of immigrate and, and all of that. And I would think, you know, all of all of these years of of, of history and um, and culture and all of that. I mean, literally, I can literally, I literally have names of my original family that came here on the boats um in 1820 and stuff i have names and, and yeah, i know and, the i know the name of the first guy in my family that got here as well so that i mean that kind of you know it it changes things that eh? it, funny enough it it sounds stupid but it, it it changes once you once you see that name in front of you or you you know my mother <coughs> on my mother's side of the family um, she actually had um, uh, 
Boer family that married into her family. Mm. So I actually have, I think I, I think months back, I sent you pictures of it, um, an actual prayer book um, mm, and Bible mm. from, yeah, from like, nice. From like uh, sixteen something or whatever. So, and the name of the person, and I can literally trace back that family tree all the way back to that person, sixteen hundred odd. Okay, so mm -hmm. you know, there's a chance that I might, my family might be longer in South Africa than your family has, but uh, mm -hmm. could be. Could be, could be. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's easy. But but that's the that's the whole. It, it changes things when you see things like that, you know. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the um, a lot of the Anglo South Africans that are um, immigrating to Mother Island and stuff, what they're doing, I think though they are sort of, <clears throat> you know, maybe one or two generations in South Africa. They can't. They're not really um, as as long as I am. You know, they came. Their fathers or grandparents probably came here in like the. The, the the 20s 30s 40s 50s when things were lacquer you know what i mean for british mm. immigrants and stuff to come yeah it would have been mm. coming to, I mean, to in, heaven, the, in the previous century south africa was the place to be especially when the economy started really picking up in the early 1900s oh yeah absolutely absolutely a lot of money uh, to be made but a lot of risks to be made as well if you, yeah. you risk big and you win big that was the the motto of south africa then in that sure. time Sure, absolutely. But it still would have been, I mean, a lot of the British oaks in that time probably came over here for the climate as well. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, funny enough, you know, Mother Island's got a horrible climate. Really. It's, it's just, it's really horrible. I mean, I have friends of mine that live there. And, <clears throat> you know, the reality of it is, is if things were going better here in South Africa, the, the real truth is they would be back here in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. They would. Mm -hmm. They would. They they really they really would. Um, a lot of a lot of my friends in the UK don't like it there. They they say it's it's miserable. The weather's miserable. They the the people a lot of the times are grumpy and you know it's just I don't know it's just not mm. Mm. you know yeah the best a, the best time a, the best time the best time in the in the UK is you know the, the, um, what's it. The best three days of the year is, you know, the UK summer, you know. And, uh, <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. Hmm. Something else I wanted to to get into before the, the show ended was uh, the intercultural relationships between your culture and other cultures. And I know in the Eastern Cape, uh, specifically your relationship with Rikosa, Uh could you, could you elaborate on that in regards to how those two communities get along uh, in the Eastern Cape uh, historically and uh, today? Hmm. Um really well <laughs> um so so you know i grew up in in the eastern cape in a small town and stuff and the and it's it's you know it's, it's a Corsa community mm. and uh if you found it was it was almost impossible to find a white oak that couldn't at least hold a very basic conversation in Corsa. I mean, mm -hmm. up until when I was, when I left school, I mean, I, when I left school, I came to Cape Town. So I've been in Cape Town for, you know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> when I left school, I could speak close up pretty fluently. And it's sadly mm -hmm. something that I've lost. Um, but, but the, the, um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, sideline. That's a perfect comment. And that's, yeah, yeah. Sideline opinion says for those that are listening and not watching, uh, Eastern Cape English generally speak cause are better than Afrikaans. <laughs> it's, it's so true. Um, you know, funny enough, the, the, you know what was very common in the um, in the Eastern Cape is um, the children that were brought up by like farmer, farm kids mm. that were brought up by nannies and they could, uh, they could, well not brought up, but you know, the nanny would spend the, the day with them while the father was out on the farm or whatever it is. And that, mm. that child could, often very often could speak Kosa before you could speak english very common very common wow. you'd be surprised mm. Mm. Uh, i know personally Koketso. i know personally mm. Mm. I don't see Koketso, my previous guest is in the chat as well he says no lies detected <laughs> yeah, yeah the Kosa, the Kosa thing like it's 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 uh, i don't know it's just you know the, the and it, and it's a good community. You know, I um, 
if you can afford me, um, if I want to tell you a a, a, a legend story, I can tell yes, you the legend. I can tell you the legend of Comrade Rob. Okay, don't know if he's listening now, but my dad is an absolute legend in the town. So, the in in, in the township, there was a uh, a guy that murdered someone in the township. Okay, and he was arrested and he was being tried in the magistrate's court. Now, my parents' house is across the road from the magistrate's court. So, when he was being tried in the magistrate's court, there was this big crowd started gathering outside the magistrate's court, you know, to you know, try and dish out some vigilante justice kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some mob justice on this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, Oaks was starting to like burn tires and stuff and it was just yeah it was getting out of control so my dad's sitting on the stoop there sipping on his coffee watching this sturdy that's going on <clears throat> and uh, uh side down opinions is asking which town uh it's a small little town in the eastern cape called cathcart uh, it's between queenstown and stutterheim tiny little place but anyway he's sitting across the, the street drinking his coffee and um he's uh um He's sitting drinking his coffee, and all of a sudden, the oak comes out of the town, out of the magistrate's court, and the cops are trying to load this oak in the in the van, but the mob's getting there, and all of a sudden they have to run back into the thing with this the van because they they the mob has tipped the cop van upside down, and um, <clears throat> if it, then another police van comes up, and then they bring this guy out, and they're trying to get him in the thing, and crowds. You know, getting in between the cops and everything. So my dad, you know, gets up and he walks across the road because next to the <coughs> next to the upside down police van is a burning tire. So my dad wants to warn them because these cops can't see this, and he wants to warn them and say, "Hey guys, there's a tire over here that's going to like set this van on fire and all of that." So mm -hmm. so he runs to the to the cop van and he tells them like he starts banging on the on the side of the car to inside of the van to tell them, Hey guys, this fire. And the cop jumps out of the van, thinks my dad's one of the protesters, tries to hit him with a shotgun, uh, with like tries to butt him with a shotgun. And, uh, <laughs> they grab my father 70 at the time. He was probably about 70 years old. They grab him, handcuff him, throw him in the back of the van with this killer. <laughs> and off they go to the police station. So needless to say, the oaks that were, you know, toy toying and stuff, they thought my dad was like fighting with them, you know, comrade, you know, and and they started like stick, sticking in cigarettes and stuff into the jail cell for my dad. And when he came out of the out of jail on the that was on the Friday, when he came out of jail on the Sunday, they were all like cheering and. Like, yeah. so now his nickname's Comrade Rob in our town. You know, this, it's a good, it's a good community vibe. You know, Oaks know my dad. Mm. They, you know, they, he's respected and and uh, Oaks respect him. You know, and uh, yeah, I thought that was quite an interesting little story, the legend of yeah, that's a Comrade Rob. Story, <laughs> um, right. So maybe my final question uh, that you could enlighten me on your culture before we go into final thoughts. Is uh, are there any cultural heroes or myths or legends uh, that your culture that you think a lot of English households uh, would know as household names? Yeah. Um, again, I don't think I don't think um, actual. You know, obviously there's Cecil John Rhodes. You know, there's um, Doctor Livingston. You know, there's there's all of those. You know, legendary characters. You know. And there are there are legendary um, <laughs> sideline opinions. Actually, knows where Cathcart is. Have mm. been to that. Have been to that court. There was a magistrate. Uh, uh, Ruan Huisen thinks he's funny. Uh, eh? An Anglo legend, an Anglo hero, Jan Smuts. Oh, uh, Jan Smuts. <laughs> that is classic. That is brilliant. I like that goose. I like that. Oh, that's classic. So um, he says. Uh, there was a magistrate with red hair in the 80s. I wasn't there in the 80s. I got there 91, I believe. But anyway. But yeah, I, I don't think that, that, that the actual characters really um, mean as much rather than the, um, than the, yeah, 
J.R. Tolkien, yeah, was born in Bloemfontein. Interesting story. Um, uh, he, he, I don't know if he, I don't think he, because he, he left, I mean, he must have been young, he must have been about seven or eight years old or something when he left uh, South Africa. But I think that he, I, I remember reading somewhere, I could be wrong here, but I remember reading somewhere that he periodically came back to visit family and stuff in South Africa. Mm. And um, some of his time was actually spent in a little town um, near uh, where I grew up called Hogs Back. And actually inside, uh, in, in that little town, there's a place called Hobbiton, which is, looks just like the little Hobbit place. So mm. it's quite, quite, quite nice. <clears throat> but back to my point, I think that it's the, the idea uh, rather than the actual uh, people and, and that sort of thing. So the idea that you are descendant of people that pretty much conquered the whole world, um, mm. I think that is, that is something that, that is unmistakable, unmistakably Anglo. And the understanding of that. Now, 100, 200 years ago, there was the the element of the white man's burden, which, um, you know, the idea that, you know, the white man needs to come and civilize the world and, and all that. By, by the white man, I mean the Anglo now needs to come and, you know, grace everyone with our amazing, uh, you know, monarchy and uh, you plebs shall now obey. You know, and um, I think that was the problem with the um, the white man's burden is it never it never changed, it never evolved. Um, you know, fifty, sixty years ago, they were still punting the idea of the white man's burden when it should have um, it should have changed. So the white man's burden, the the Rudyard Kipling idea as well of the white man's burden, and I think that. It never, it never really evolved. It never changed. It never moved with the times, and I think that that is part of the British uh, or the Anglo downfall in a lot of the colonies and, and that sort of thing. And instead of, it was always what it did to people, what it did to Anglo's is it is it instilled some form of uh, superiority or, you know, mm. um, and and I think the superiority that, complex. Yeah, I think that um, that was that that was a problem because it made people weak. Um, it, it it took them off of being on their toes, if that makes any sense. So um, mm. you know things like things like being afraid and things like being vulnerable and that sort of thing. Those are things that keep you on your toes. Um, thinking that you have the whole world at your at, at your feet, that's things that make you weak. You know. And I think that's where the that's where the white man's burden um, failed. <clears throat> I think that it might have started off um, really uh, good, but um, yeah. See, Graham said what well, he spent a few days in Hogsback when he was a very young boy. He left SA when he was three. Tolkien connection is mytholo mytho mythological more than anything else. Well, there we go. There now you have your myth. <laughs> but um, I see it, okay, so, so, uh, finish your thought there, and then you can get to this comment. But no, no, I, I, I think that um, that it, it, it definitely came from a good place. So the white man's burden definitely came from a good place. Um, <clears throat> but, but I think that it, it, and you know what, I, you know what, Aaron, I, I don't want to get too technical into this, but this is also um, a if it's not if it's not controlled and it's not managed. It's also sort of a Calvinist um, idea, the the idea that, and I know that I know that Christians are called to set themselves aside from others, but um, <clears throat> you know that I, I don't want to get too technical into this, on, into the idea of the Calvinist idea of predestination and that sort of thing, but um, it it can allow you to sort of think that you are a people set aside from others. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what the Anglos, um, unfortunately, the white man's burden, I think that's what, um, that's what it did, mm -hmm. uh, very much so. And I see uh, Koketso says, many people discount the fact that the explorers, Anglo or not, were chasing their dream at great risk, often in unmapped territory. Brave. Yeah, definitely. Hey? And, that's, and, and Koketso, that's exactly what I'm saying is that it's 
is that that is the Anglo myth, the idea that you know you were frontiermen. You know, in the Eastern Cape, I remember I remember this quite fondly. Uh, there's a place as you there's a little hill as you come into um, into my hometown, into Cathcart, and you go up this hill. It's called Hobbs Hill, <clears throat> and on the on the side there's a little sign that says "Welcome to Frontier Country," and that <laughs> that that is is pretty much the the dream you know the the frontier mm -hmm. idea and it's that sort of mythology that um that that is something that is that is unfortunately lost or or fading very fast and amongst um anglo um specifically anglo south africans it's quite it's quite common and quite well preserved in um in places like the US, Australia, New Zealand, these sort of things. Because you know what I mean? It's like I said, times are good there. So, um, well, relatively good. But, um, but um, you know, like I said, when times get tough, Oaks, the Anglos generally sort of retreat back to their, their hub, you know, back to the mothership. And um, because they can, you know, because they can. And that's the thing. The, what 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 the Boers did, or what the Afrikaans people did, is they they made a pact that when they leave, they cut off ties. That's it. Finish and klar. Once is klar. We're done. We're on our own, and we are now going to determine our own future. And right. that's the difference. That's the difference between the Anglo's and the and the Boers. Is yeah, we might have spoke about you know we're like you know. We want to be independent and stuff like the Rhodesians and stuff. And they would have been willing to go to war and everything about it. But, you know, when the war was lost and Oaks lost, okay, guys, all right, we'll go and put on the red shirts and we'll jump on the mothership, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't, yeah. it, there was never, there was never a sort of bitter end idea behind it. Mm. Yeah. All right, Scott, uh, we've reached the end of the show. So my final question to you would be uh what do you think is the importance of culture and what do you think uh is there still a, a role for culture to play in the in a modern world where a lot of where culture seems to be under constant attack yeah if i can just if i can just read a sideline opinions comment over here which yes. is bang on sorry honest he says the aristocracy and the monarchy made some english very materialistic unlike the eastern cape english mm. this is 100 percent true you know um, and, and it's visible in, in, if you take an oak, like sideline opinions, I don't know where you live now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you would agree with me that if you walk down the streets here in Cape Town, okay, and you walk past a, or, or you meet a, an English guy from Cape Town, you know, historically Cape Townian, and you meet an English guy from the Eastern Cape or KZN. Within seconds, you can tell the difference. Within seconds, and that's see, that uh, another comment here says uh, an exasperated Olive Schreiner on Anglo South Africans said, uh, "Fancy a whole nation of lower middle Philistines and without any aristocracy of blood to save them." Yeah, exactly. That's the whole thing. Is you know, the, the aristocracy and stuff is always going to be there, unfortunately, to save those oaks asses you know yeah. and not not me i mean i could i mean i probably could but i i just um i just won't but yeah silent yeah you see so sideline opinions agrees with me. but yeah, yeah so your thoughts on the on the role of culture and the importance of culture to to end things off look Ernst, um culture is everything um in order for a society to to remain strong, there has to be some sort of culture. Um, you know, in in my mind, um, you know, obviously me being a Christian, <clears throat> culture. Um, so Christianity obviously influences our culture directly, as a as a Christian. But if you don't have culture now. I'm saying this as an Anglo South African, an oak who is was was raised in not an explicitly cultural environment, like mm -hmm. the Afrikaners are raised. Okay, so you guys have your foot tracker days, you have your uh, day of the vow, you know, you have all of these amazing, amazing holidays that are um, um, 
vitally important to to Afrikaans people, and they are celebrated. You know, you might know, you might have noticed that this is the bicentennial of the eighteen twenty settlers. Mm. You might you might not you might have noticed that you might not have. Well, you know, and that's you know that just gives you an idea of where of where Anglo culture is today in South Africa. It's it's nowhere, um, but but it has to be revived. Okay, what you do with the culture and stuff is the most important thing. Um, and um, and you know my myself. Um, I see Mr. Patriarch's in the comments over there. Um, Mr. Patriarch and, and myself and some other oaks and that sort of thing. What what we want to do is we want to just sort of set out to 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 make people understand and realize the importance of an Anglo culture. And the importance of because even though even though Mr. Patriarch is American, he's also he's an Anglophone. Okay, so a lot of the things that 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 I you know my I, things that I do culturally, he does as well, and um, we need to. Uh, and unfortunately, that is um, there's there's benefits to that, and there are also you know it's also a bad thing because that's just a, that's just proof that 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 Anglo the Anglo culture as a whole is is the globalist is the culture of globalism. You know, we did a we did a stream on this. You know. Um, English language is the language of globalism, and um, and it's unfortunate that that that's the situation. But there are a lot of great stories, great ideas, specific to South Africa um, that we need to sort of cultivate, and we need to um, renew, and we need to all we need to do is just remind people of these great stories. Um, and um, and they're not stories of capitulation. They're not stories of of weakness. They're not stories of um, uh, you know just sort of relying on the crown and that sort of thing. There were some great great Anglo's out there that 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 fought. And uh, you know some of the Anglo's, some of the good Anglo's, actually fought with the Boers in the Boer War um, because they realised they were also like you know you know what I'm done with this. I don't want the crown anymore. I don't want it. I want to be liberated from that. Mm. And and that's that's basically you know, you know the importance of culture. It's vitally important. Mm. Like uh, like Brendan here says, uh, the Brits who are here here in South Africa left Great Britain for a reason. Yeah, that's exactly what I said, uh, Brendan. My uh, earlier on is that my ancestors left um, left my island uh, two hundred years ago to the year. And, you know, they left for a reason. So I'm not going to go and try and undo that. You know what I mean? Mm. But, yeah. Scott, thank you very much for joining me tonight. It was a very enlightening discussion. Uh, I definitely learned a lot of uh, new things, and uh, especially about uh, some South African architecture. And also, uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone that tuned in. Um, really appreciate the fact that you add to the discussion with your questions and your comments. I really enjoyed the banter in the chat. Um, if you want to uh, hear more from Scott, you can find him, uh, the show that he co-hosts, uh, Reactionary Opinions. There's a link in the description, so you can go check it out. And if you're new to this channel, uh, you can click subscribe if you like these types of uh, conversations. I'm going to be having a lot more of them as well. My culture series will continue. Um, and yeah, so I'll check you guys on the next one. And uh, Scott, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, Adams, can I just... Highlight Mr. Patriarch's comment over there. He says, "Is the glo is global is the globalism because England is connected to liberalism at the hip?" Yes. <laughs> and I say, <laughs> see, uh, one of my former guests as well, Nzuzo says, "Thanks, Scott. Learned a lot." Uh, well, Thanks, and Nzuzo. Mr. Thanks, Patriarch. Says, Stay based, guys. And afraid to watch. It says, "Thank you for your time, Scott. Interesting discussion." All right, guys. Thanks, Enjoy buddy. the rest of your evening, uh, and I hope you also have an excellent weekend. God bless. Bye.